Hey guys, welcome back to another dining room chalkboard lecture for the political reform class. Today is day 60 on the self-quarantine count-up. These round 10 seem to be pretty momentous, but 60, I don't know, 50 was big, I'm waiting for 75, I'm waiting for 100. They're coming, those, those high count-ups are coming for us. Uh, anyway, what concerns you more directly is that this is now week seven, um, and this is the only lecture this week in week seven on direct democracy. We're rounding out uh, or finishing up part two of the class where I've been looking at, at like getting from here to there, what it is that it takes to get a political reform across the finish line, and mostly in this part deepening the sort of original discussion of the four avenues of uh, political reform. In this case, obviously, direct democracy is an avenue. No uh, other lecture this week. You do have a paper due. Don't forget about that. Uh, and again, I've been saying this uh, pretty frequently, but it's week seven. The term is coming to an end, and pretty soon everything's going to be due, and grades are going to be in. Uh, it, it happens very quickly. I think it happens even more quickly in a term like this, where things are totally different than they usually are. You don't have your usual stimulus to let you know that, okay, the term is coming to an end. So be mindful of deadlines and organization, uh, and just know also that pretty soon this ex uh, experiment in remote instruction, at least version one, where we had two weeks to put it into play, is about to be is about to come to an end. All right, direct democracy. What am I going to do today? Uh, well, I'm going to address the question of this avenue of reform is available already. Uh, it is available at least in a limited fashion. Uh, it's available largely uh, across the country for constitutional amendments. I think I didn't probably make that point clear enough when I did my survey of the various states that uh, state constitutions are open to amendment by uh, direct democracy. Uh, in some cases, it's, it, it is part of the two-tiered uh, um, approach to to filtering constitutional amendments, where the legislature has to pass something and then that has to be approved by a referendum uh, of the people. Most states actually have some kind of referendum final vote by the people. Some states actually have an initiative uh, version. So one of the things about direct democracy is we have initiative and referendum. Uh, and the third piece of uh, direct democracy traditionally is the recall election, which is not relevant to reform in any way. Now, direct democracy is an avenue of reform, and it's an avenue of reform in both political reform and regular policy reform. Uh, the, the question before us in this class about political reform is, direct democracy is an avenue of uh, political reform, uh, but also it's an avenue of policy reform. Should that avenue that exists already, should that avenue be widened? Um, should there be more opportunities for people, the American people, um, or the people of various states to use the avenue of direct democracy to achieve policy reform? Um, for the most part, what we would be looking at to broaden this avenue, to create more opportunities for uh, the people to determine policy outcomes directly, either through the initiative or the referendum, and there is an important difference between these, and I'll get to those, um, is uh, that would, that's a political reform. A political reformer who wants to broaden this avenue is going to actually have to use a different avenue of political reform to broaden this avenue of policy reform. I, I hope this isn't too convoluted. It sounds a little convoluted as I'm saying it, but I just want to get back to the very first class. There are two types of reform. Political reform, which changes the way the political system functions, and then all other types of reform are essentially policy area reform. Immigration reform, tax reform, uh, social, wel or welfare, uh, social welfare reform, criminal justice reform, education reform. Basically, I should have, I realized today as I was looking over this lecture that I should have just said political versus policy reform. Because political reform changes the system and the system is used to make policy. And so uh, when you make uh, political reforms, you're essentially transforming the way that the policy-making process uh, is carried out. The question about direct democracy, we've seen how it can be an avenue for political reform, but the question today before us is, should we try to make this avenue of policy-making more widely and more easily available to the American people in, in, in various versions uh, at the local, state, and the federal level? Now, 
The difference between an initiative is that this comes from the people, and the referendum is to the people. It's referred from the legislature, and here it's initiated by the people. Uh, and you might say, okay, well, we can't treat both of these things the same. We can't just lump initiatives and referendums into the same uh, category because when we're analyzing the process, they have very different processes. For example, the referendum comes from the legislature, and the question that we have then is, well, what does it take to refer a vote to the people? Um, most states, it just takes a simple majority in both uh, houses of the legislature to send it to the people. Uh, there may be, I'm not aware of states where it also, also requires the signature of the governor to do so, but I think it doesn't. I think that the normal filter of, uh, to the two-pass filter of the legislature passes it and the governor either signs it into law or vetoes it, is changed over to the, a, a different second filter, which is the, the, the people. Part of what you might say is, well, okay, could we actually... Um, either raise or lower the threshold for referring a bill to the people. Um, in other words, might you be able to actually, uh, with only 40% of the legislature, get a referendum there? And why would that make any sense? Uh, so far, we don't have anything like a sub-majority, right? We have super-majorities. To get a constitutional amendment in the U.S. Uh, Constitution, it takes two layers of supermajority, a two-thirds vote in both houses of Congress, no signature or veto by the president, um, and then three-quarters of the states. So we have supermajorities all over the place. Why would a sub-majority make sense? Well, a sub-majority could make sense because what you want to do is you want to create an avenue for minority uh, um, parties to be able to put something before the people, right? So the, in your state, there's a Democratic majority in the legislature and there's a Republican minority, and yet a lot of people in the state support Republican policies. Why shouldn't the people get to speak on those policies just because the Republican Party is not in the majority? Um, now, you might say, and the tr I would say the traditional answer is, the reason why you don't is because what that means is the Republican Party has to organize to win the majority, to get its policy priorities onto the agenda. Um, and that's a correct answer given the way our system is, but we can always ask, well, why? Why should we, uh, a party that wants to put something on the policy agenda, why should it have to have only one method of getting control of that agenda? Taking control of the majority of seats in the legislature, which is actually a very difficult thing to do in the sense that um, if you have, uh, as we do in Oregon, we have 60 members of the House of Representatives. To get a majority, to be able to elect the Speaker of the House and to be able to control the policy agenda, in other words, to be able to get things in, th out of committees and onto the floor vote and voted ahead, uh, you have to have 31 seats. Let's say that you have 25 seats. Well, you only need a net pickup of six, which is not a huge percentage, but you have to gain those six seats, not statewide, not just by getting more voters to support uh, your party's candidates, uh, as you would in a proportional system, but by winning specific geographic areas. Um, and that particular kind of political uh, action, political strategy, is more difficult than just getting a majority of votes. Um, it's also possible, both specifically in gerrymandered states uh, and even just for uh, um, sort of uh, political demographic distribution reasons, it's also possible for the majority of people in a state to vote for candidates from one party and yet have the other party control a majority of seats in the legislature. And so that party has already garnered the attention of a large chunk of the electorate, a majority, and yet doesn't have the seats in the legislature to move their policy agenda forward. Now, that actually is obviously a chronic uh, problem in states wh that where there's gerrymandering and there's the, the ability. Wisconsin is, is the most uh, clear case of this where the Democratic Party won something like 60% of the seats, and the, uh, excuse me, the votes in state legislative elections, and the Republican Party controls uh, something like 60% of the seats in the state legislature. So the Democratic Party has won a lot of votes and convinced a lot of voters that its agenda is the one that should be moving forward, yet because uh, the uh, seat by seat uh, victories went the other way, uh, there's the Democratic Party basically has to play defense. They can't play offense on their agenda, even though... So, why a sub-majority? It would be an interesting way to say, okay, our representative system isn't 
the one, the only avenue through which policy should get made, obviously that's what direct democracy is about, but also it should have a counterbalance that there are problems with our representative system where we don't just want another opportunity for policy to get made, in a way we want to check on the policy. So I don't know of really anybody who's proposing a sub-majority, I think it would be super uh, unpopular, um, obviously, uh, and I also think it would, it would uh, raise a lot of dangers, but just in theoretical possibility, we could have a referendum threshold that says, if you have 40% of the legislators in both houses of um, a legislature who uh, vote for a referendum, it goes to the people. And then maybe you could counterbalance that with a supermajority on the second pass, that the referendum has to pass with 55% of the votes, and you could even put some kind of threshold on voter turnout. You could say that voter turnout could be no less than 75% of what it was in the previous gubernatorial election, because that way, if, if, if the referendum gets scheduled in some special election slot, like a spring primary, like we have coming up here in Oregon, and voter turnout is low, uh, we don't end up with just uh, something getting passed with minority support in the legislature, and then not very many people voting. So there's all kinds of, you can use thresholds um, with both super and uh, sub-majorities to make sure that things check each other out. But one of the reasons why a sub-majority might even make sense is because direct democracy is not just a opportunity for the people to take control of the policy-making process in addition to the representative system, the legislature. It may be that part of the thing is, is that it's, it is a check on the legislature. And proponents of, uh, especially the initiative, but both forms of direct democracy, one of the things that many proponents talk about is that it essentially would be widening this avenue of normal policy uh, making process to include uh, it's, you know, initiatives at the national level, referendums at the national level, and to, to uh, get it in more states than have it, uh, and in the states that have it, to lower the thresholds for actually getting something before the ballot, is that the representative system would have to take account of this particular um, new democratic process and adjust in relation to its existence, right? So if the people can make laws more easily, then the elected lawmakers would have an incentive to behave differently than they do. Uh, now, initiative is a different thing because the initiative is where the elected representatives have no control over the policy making process at all. The people initiate and then vote on policies directly themselves. So this re uh, requires the participation of the legislature and this circumvents the legislature. And so you can see that you could support one and not the other. We could say, all right, you know, we're, gonna, we're going to introduce a sub-majority uh, um, referendum process, and we're going to create a two, a two, uh, two different filters, a sub-majority legislative referendum. So if 40% of the members of a state legislature vote in favor of a referendum, it goes on the next general election ballot, and then we add, some, uh, we add a supermajority, and we say it has to pass with 55% support of the people, and it also uh, has to, the voter turnout has to be a certain threshold above what the previous gubernatorial election turnout was and set it at say 75 or 80% so that there can be some slippage uh, with you know, acknowledging that from election to election voter turnout can vary, but that if you set it high enough, at least it means that a lot of people voted on this thing. And then you can say, well, we don't wanna have an initiative at all. What we want, the problem that we have with our state is that there is uh, essentially an incapacitated minority. And the only way that the incapacitated minority can get its policies uh, implemented, or even looked at or voted on, is by winning a bunch of district seats and getting into the majority. And that, of course, is always a possibility, right? If you control the majority of seats in a legislature, you have the ability to move on your agenda. The question is, do we want to or not want to uh, encourage or um, empower the minority to have an easier chance not passing laws, right? We're not talking about 40% threshold for passing a law. That really, I mean, that is very easy to say, well, that's, that is actually undemocratic to allow a law to go into effect when most of the legislatures actually, legislators voted against it. But we've seen a lot of two-tiered processes in the, this class, and so why not invent that? And then say, but we don't want an initiative. We, what we want to do is we want to empower the elected minority 
so that when they can't quite pull off winning enough seats to have a majority, they're not dead in the water just waiting around, uh, killing time until they get into the majority. So that would actually be saying, well, the biggest problem is that we want to empower the minority. So uh, I'm going to look at, I'm going to put this up on the board and I'm going to talk a little bit about this more, but the two so things we're going to look at uh, in relation to uh, widening this avenue of direct democracy is what problems does it solve? And then, potentially, what problems does it create? And different versions of a, of a direct democratic uh, process would solve different problems and create uh, new different problems. So one of the problems that uh, is not is is would be solved by this, you know, I would say fairly innovative and really you know very unlikely type of direct democracy, a sub-majority refer, uh, referral vote and a supermajority uh, um, popular vote. That would solve the problem of minority voice, no minority, lack of minority power. And one of the things that I, I think that was clear in the reading for today, the chapter six of the debating reform, and is that it's direct democracy as an avenue for policy making is a response to perceived insufficiencies or problems with the legislative system. So we're directly today the problems that we're solving uh, or addressing um, are all going to be problems with the legislature. So one of them is that we really have a lack of minority power. Uh, there, you know, different legislatures have different rules that give the minority certain kinds of rights, and there are certain procedural maneuvers that minorities can, can pull off. If you uh, can uh, stage a walkout, as minority parties uh, do occasionally, you can deny the majority a quorum so they can't move forward on their business, so, so their agenda is never advanced. What that doesn't do is that doesn't give the minority the ability to actually get anything on the agenda. It just allows the minority to block it with, with this very uh, sort of uh, difficult and rare move to block the majority's movement forward on its agenda. Why should the minority party not have some way, other than winning the next election and getting a majority, um, to have input into what gets decided on, what gets chosen by the people? So this problem would be uh, created, uh, would be solved by some kind of referendum that empowers a majority, a minority, to get a vote onto uh, the, um, the agenda. The initiative itself also addresses the lack of minority power, right? If, if you're in the minority and you want a policy that you know the majority party is never gonna even uh, look at, much less uh, uh, vote on and definitely not pass, then you can go straight to the people and say, okay, you know, the, uh, a lot of people in this state uh, are in favor of, um, you know, legalizing marijuana. Uh, a lot of the people in this state are in favor of raising the corporate tax rate. A lot of people in this state are in favor of uh, creating a uh, single payer healthcare system within the state. But the majority party has zero interest in any of these policies and in fact is totally opposed to all of these policies and so we're never going to get them through our legislative system. Uh, how do we potentially get this? Well, one avenue is you win, you win elections seat by seat and you take the majority and you move forward on that agenda. Um, and if a lot of people in your state really do support those policies, that's not an impossible task. But it also may not be an easy task and it often is not an easy task especially in gerrymandered states, but even in other states where the population is distributed unevenly because people move to places where they want to move. They don't move there for, for political or policy reasons necessarily. So the initiative allows the people to basically have a lack of minority power, minority that in this case being not the minority in the population, but the minority of elected officials. Um, what's another problem with the legislature that makes uh, direct democracy compelling. Um, one is that we have lack of responsive, responsiveness. And most of these are gonna be lacks of. The people elect their representatives and they elect them 
with the expectation that they're going to go advance the policies that they promised at the campaign trail and that they're going to solve the problems that uh, the people care about uh, with policy solutions to those problems. And yet, traditionally, that doesn't happen very fast and it doesn't happen very comprehensively. Um, and the people are often thwarted in their desire for their elected officials to do the things that they sent them there to do. Congress in the last decade or so has had abysmal approval ratings, you know, in the teens. But even among, in the best of times, even in the least divisive times, even in the times when approval for the government is at high levels, Congress itself routinely has less than 50% of approval rating. Um, uh, and that at the same time that members of Congress have an 85 to 90% incumbent return, uh, recumbent, incumbent re-election rate, which means that people get re-elected very at a high percentage, but Congress has a low approval rate. And it's largely because of the responsiveness problem, is that people are like, what are you doing? Get, do, do what I want you to do. Well, why do they keep re-electing the same people? Why is the incumbent re-election rate so high when, dis when approval for the institution that, as a whole is so low? Well, that's one of the interesting things about the district-based system is that people can look at Congress or their state legislature and say, you're not doing anything, get something done. Yet they look at their specific elected representative and they say, I'm happy with you. Or you, you're, the, you're pushing for the things I want. I don't blame you for the lack of, of responsiveness. Or I've actually, you're actually providing constituent services to me and people that are like me. So yeah, you're a good person to have there. It's just that collectively, you're bad. So, so the difference between a collective evaluation of Congress, which is routinely low, and state legislatures is often very low, and an individual uh, um, evaluation of your particular member, this is actually one of the things that makes it tricky to turn over the majority from one party to another. You have to create a kind of a high level of dissatisfaction with individual people uh, who are elected to be able to win back a majority. And so um, the lack of responsiveness is standard and typical, and it creates a lot of frustration and disapproval on the part of the American people. The idea of giving the people the ability to initiate policies means that when they're frustrated with the slow pace of problem solving in the legislature, they can take matters into their own hand. They can initiate what their elected officials are failing to initiate. And I think that it's a very common problem that Americans have with the government as a whole, or with uh, Congress, or a state legislature, or a city council, or whatever body is a collective body, that do something. That's, why aren't you doing something? Um, and the people who are there have been elected by the people, but they, they aren't necessarily, you get elected by the people, Giving the people what they want is not necessarily, this is kind of a weird feature of the democratic system, is not necessarily the best way to get re-elected by people. I've, I've talked about this actually, if you're in my campaigns class as well as this class, you've seen me talk about this and I'll just take a quick uh, side detour here. Uh, if, if your goal as a um, elected official, personal goal, is to get stuff done, that's why you go into politics. And to get stuff done, you have to not only get elected, you have to get re-elected. And to get reelected, you have to make sure people don't, people don't turn against you. And one of the easiest ways to get people to turn against you is to actually give them what they asked for, and then they're dissatisfied with it. Um, this is a common political dynamic that uh, I was elected to, you know, uh, to address climate change. I pushed for and voted for a carbon tax, and now people are pissed because the carbon tax has raised prices and has uh, um, diminished their capacity to you know, air, do airline travel, whatever it is, there's, there's often a backlash that's involved with giving people what they want. So politicians themselves know this, and they understand that you have to make it seem like you're solving problems and moving forward um, so that people will vote for you and continue supporting you. But, if you. but you want to often fall short of actually succeeding at passing something, because uh, if you, if you uh, don't succeed but seem like you're trying, people are going to continue to support you. Um, it strikes me actually now that I'm saying this that I think I talked about this last week uh, when I talked about statutory reform, but that's one of the reasons why uh, that we, we get sporadic progress on uh, statutory, um, uh, or on the passage of legislation. So I've talked about it in this class too. That's, that's a lack of responsiveness. The initiative takes care of that. The referendum uh, doesn't necessarily take care of it either, though it, it, it takes care of it in a different way because the referendum is a way of essentially shirking political responsibility for something. Rather than passing the carbon tax 
and then facing the backlash from the people, what you do is you refer the carbon tax bill to the people and let them vote on it. And when the yes vote comes through, and then, then some people are like, oh no, wait a minute, this is, I, this is not such a great idea. They're living with the consequences of their own choice. And they may punish the legislators because they're just pissed in general and that could create a, you know, a, a political backlash against the majority party. But what they're probably going to do is not punish the legislators. So the referendum is, a, is actually a great mechanism for shirking political responsibility. Uh, and the more we make it available, that means that legislators themselves can actually put stuff out there. They can try to solve problems. They can, they can do what they got into politics to do without having to have that hovering fear of backlash that, uh, um, that the normal legislative process can, always, can often produce, right? So um, the, another problem that's solved that's related to lack of responsiveness is lack of motivation to legislate. And I'm going to put that in parentheses because I think that that's not the only cause of uh, unresponsiveness. There's also the fact that it's very difficult to get something through a legislature, even if you're committed to making sure that this policy gets across the finish line and this uh, problem, which is facing your constituents, gets solved in a timely manner, even if, it, even if it might produce political backlash. There's also just the obstacles of a collective institution uh, filled with a bunch of people who made specific promises that don't all necessarily line up. Um, <clears throat> there's also the problem of the fact that the majority party um, has a huge agenda in theory, but it can only, with the amount of time that it has and the amount of public attention on certain issues, it can only move on a few priorities at a time. And so in those, all those other areas, there's a lack of responsiveness. Um, another problem that is, I would say, two-way, this is a problem that legislators, people who are elected face, and voters uh, have a backlash of this, is that there's a lack of clarity about policy preferences. Legislative elections, representative elections, are elections for individual people in individual districts, and the individual people running against each other all have policy stances, they make campaign promises, they, ha they, they have uh, to the extent that they're willing to, to kind of have courage or know that it's a smart thing to do. They take strong stands on certain things, and then somebody wins. And then the question becomes for that elected official, okay, what does my victory mean in terms of what the voters wanted? Uh, most elected officials will just declare a mandate. This is particularly true for executives who are elected governors and presidents, they'll say, I won, and what that means is the people won everything I promised, and so I'm gonna move on all of them. Um, and that is usually just a, a way of kind of garnering and, and, and scraping in as much political capital as possible. I don't think that the, the people actually, uh, the elected officials who, who make those claims actually believe that they this is really a clear mandate. They're claiming a mandate because it helps give them the ability to actually like keep maybe a couple of those promises. But the problem is, and you know, if you wanna get reelected, um, and, or if you just want to be a good, responsive elected official, okay, I won. What does that mean? What do I give the people? Uh, do I get, try to give them all the things that I promised, right? Um, so uh, Donald Trump made a couple of marquee promises. You know, he was going to repeal and replace Obamacare. He was going to lower taxes. He was going to build a wall. He was going to have an America first uh, foreign policy. He was going to drain the swamp, right? And that's, there's a few, and he was going to put conservatives on the Supreme Court. He wins the election. What does that mean? Is that a mandate for all of those things? Uh, if, if you want to, to, like, to please people and win re-election, which of those things should you give them? Which should you focus on? Elected officials, they use a combination of, of intuition and political instinct and polling to try to figure that out. But our electoral system gives them no ability to know what the policy preferences of the people are specifically on issue by issue. So Donald Trump uh, also promises to reduce emissions regulations and lower uh, or at least prevent the raising of mileage, miles per gallon uh, standards uh, via the EPA. Do the American people want that? It's, most surveys show no, that the vast majority of people don't want to move backwards in environmental policy that way, even people who are on the conservative side of moderate. Uh, yet. 
he's going to uh, claim a mandate. Same thing with a governor. You know, it's you, you make a bunch of promises, you win, you have four years, and you basically can say, well, all the things I ran on are what the people of my state want, and so I'm going to try to give it to them. Legislators and executives don't really know, and in fact, part of the reason for unresponsiveness, a lot of these lacks are, are interconnected, is that um, elected officials, even with good polling and even with good strategy, don't necessarily know what their victories mean. And they do know what it takes to get reelected, but what they don't necessarily know is, could they do more in terms of completing policies, passing laws, uh, creating regulations, uh, engaging in executive action, could they do more to address the problems that are out there and the people would be behind them? Or if they did more, would the people be against them? It, it, it is a, essentially, it's a guessing game. And our electoral system, our representative system, any electoral system, but particularly a winner-take-all district-based one, is, gives very little quality information to either the people themselves like, well, what do we want? Uh, I, voted, I know what I voted for, but a majority of people voted for this candidate. Does that mean that the people want what that candidate wants? And it gives precious little information to the elected officials themselves. The initiative and referendum both do so uh, in different ways, right? Uh, one of the reforms that I proposed, or the reform I proposed for the speech, was the presidential referendum. And the great thing about the presidential referendum, in my view, is that it gives presidents the ability to keep a campaign promise, but keep it in a way that they're sure was actually part of their mandate because the majority of, of people are going to approve of that specific policy, right? I said build the wall, and I, got, I won, and I think that that means that people want me to give them the wall. Well, instead of giving them the wall in a way that maybe pisses off a lot of people who don't vote for me, I'm gonna give them the ability to give themselves the wall. And if it goes down to defeat, I mean, that's gonna be stinging, of course, because it was one of your promises and you believed in it. Um, and for Donald Trump, of course, it would be, I would say, you know, probably crushing to his ego uh, because I think he does believe that people want the wall. But to a sort of uh, open-minded, responsive uh, executive, be like, oh, okay, my victory didn't mean a mandate to push this particular policy. And, and much like the legislative referendum, it allows you to escape political responsibility. You, you, do, you don't do something that you think the people want and then face backlash to it. I think that um, if Barack Obama had the ability to put some kind of healthcare reform uh, as a referendum vote to the American people, that would have been much more relaxing and there probably wouldn't have been the same kind of backlash in the 2010 election uh, that there was because a referendum is always going to give you a little bit of coverage in terms of uh, in terms of political responsibility and the hit to your political capital that comes from pushing something into the world that then people are like, well, I wanted healthcare reform, but I didn't want that. That's messed up. That's not what I wanted. I said I wanted healthcare reform, but you gave me the wrong kind. Um, that's actually one of the big problems with uh, or blockages to responsiveness is that elected officials are wary of facing that kind of backlash. So. Um, Initiatives and referendums both allow the people to express their direct policy preferences on issues, not just vaguely on candidates, right? And when you vote for a candidate, it almost never tells them, and it doesn't even necessarily come from you as, well, you're, you're, the, you're the, um, the gun control, pro-environmental, ta tax-cutting person, right? Uh, I voted for you because I liked two out of those three. Which two out of those three? It's a guessing game. For the, for the elected official. Um, and for the most part, if you think about the people that you vote for, that you even pay attention to all their issues, you're not gonna like their stance on all the issues. It's, it's practically impossible. So uh, this is a gap. This is essentially one of the problems with the representative system is that the electoral system provides very little information to elected officials about what the people actually want out of them. It gives them a general idea, but it doesn't give any specifics. So both the initiative and the referendum solve this one. Uh, the final problem is not actually a lack of, it's disproportionate power to certain groups. And the disproportionate power is held by groups that have the ability to successfully lobby 
through the legislative system, through the representative system, um, or through the executive uh, regulation process uh, making system. Not all groups have the same potential to influence the legislative process. And in fact, this is where we get the term special interests, even though, in my opinion, all interest groups are asking for a special interest. There's nothing more special about one than the other. Um, but uh, what it does is it gives certain groups the ability to win more often. Um, one of the top reasons that gives a, uh, an interest group the, re uh, the ability to win is uh, unity and cohesiveness of their uh, members of their interest group. The National Rifle Association uh, wins legislative battles all the time, mostly because they're playing defense, and it's always easier to play defense uh, to stop things from getting enacted than it is to repeal them, but also because the NRA has a um, loyal group of voters who are mostly, not entirely, but mostly single-issue voters. They will vote based on a candidate or legislator's position and history on gun control regulations. Uh, and since there are millions of members of the NRA, and since they focus their informational campaigns on rating uh, um, elected officials and candidates based on their voting record, um, it gives that group the ability to lobby successfully. Since you, an NRA lobbyist can walk into a legislator's office and say, there's 25,000 NRA members, single issue voter members in your district. And uh, like basically they don't even have to give them money or anything, they just say, so if you vote for this gun control law, we're gonna we're gonna put that in our literature. We're, you're gonna it's gonna be a ding to your score, and our voters our, our members are gonna vote against you, and you're gonna lose. These are crucial to your to your reelection. Um, that gives that group, and and it, it, people often assume that the power of the NRA comes from money because there's this kind of presumption that money wins always in politics. Money often wins, but the NRA is a perfect example of an organization that spends a fraction of what other organizations spend compared to, say, the American Medical Association's lobbying, or the pharmaceutical industry's lobbying, or the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. They spend way, way, way more. And the reason why they spend more is because they don't have the cohesive, large, unified, single-issue voter members that the membership that the NRA has. Um, and uh, that means they have to leverage other aspects of their power, financial power, to be able to get what they want. So some groups are able to lobby successfully because they have money. Some groups are able to lobby successfully because they have large memberships. Some groups are able to lobby successfully because they have cohesive single issue member. Uh, obviously, if you had all three of those things, that would be ideal. But the resources, political resources, are distributed very unevenly in our society. Uh, and in any free society, they're gonna be distributed un uh, very unevenly. Um, if the law-making, policy-making process runs through one institution, then whatever groups have the resources that make that institution respond to their wishes are going to have more power than any organization or interest group that, that doesn't have those kinds of resources. What those other groups might have is they might have numbers and voters. They might have support for their, uh, for their policies, but Support, public support for a policy is not in any way linked, I shouldn't say in any way, it's not strongly linked to a positive policy outcome, right? Vast majorities of Americans, not vast majorities, large majorities of Americans, strong majorities approve of all kinds of stuff that state legislatures and Congress will never pass because those legislator, legislators don't look at the Gallup poll and say, wow, 65% of Americans approve of uh, common sense gun regulations. So let's find some common sense gun regulations and pass them because that's what the American people want. Um, they look at their voters and say, okay, what percentage of the key voters that will get me reelected approve of this? They're not gonna be looking at these uh, opinion polls. And then they're also going to be subject to, to the disproportionate power of different groups who are gonna come in and say, you know, I don't care what 65% of Americans say, our group, which commands financial resources and uh, um, or activist energy and votes is we want you to go in this direction. So th this connects also to lack of responsiveness. American people are like, opinion polls show we want X, Y, and Z. Why are we not getting X, Y, and Z? Right? Some, some now large and growing percentage of the American people want uh, either some kind of um, government public option for healthcare or Medicaid for all. Um, and uh, that, it, 
Even if it was 60% of Americans that wanted Medicaid for all, 60% is a very strong majority, we're not necessarily going to get it. And that's because, partly because of the, you know, the, the uh, um, election of representatives in a district by district way, if we had a proportional system, 60% of Americans could vote for pro-Medicaid for all candidates and 60% of that party would be occupying the legislature. Disproportionate power, though, means that is, is a result of the fact that in, for the most part, at the national level, absolutely, and in, in most states, there is only one way to get your policy across the finish line, and that's to have a majority of elected representatives be in favor of that and be willing to stick their necks out politically for that and to put it at the top of their agenda. So uh, the initiative particularly is seen as a remedy to this, that uh, essentially large groups that are not politically well-resourced, they're not organized, they don't have money, they don't have a cohesive uh, um, single-issue voter uh, base, but they're, they're in favor of a particular policy, right? The, there are strong majorities of Americans want, for example, more aggressive action on climate change. Certainly strong uh, uh, percentage of Americans are gonna, going to want, going forward from this moment in history, going to want a much better uh, preparedness for pandemics and uh, a, uh, a more concerted um, uh, providing of healthcare resources for times of emergency. And yet, they may not be able to get that through the elected legislative system. So these are all problems, and I should put this with the legislature, or I should say with the representative system, because it can also be executive representation that is, is, is part of the problem, lack of responsiveness. Um, lack of minority power, lack of responsiveness, lack of clarity about policy preferences, and disproportionate power that some groups have. Direct democracy in one way or another, however you decide to make the thresholds of various things, what, what's the signature requirement, do we put in some kind of quirky sub-majority, super-majority combo for the, the referendum, um, would address these problems. Now, the articles for today, the debate, uh, was about a national initiative versus a national referendum. So I'm going to focus on that issue when I look at problems created, but I'm also going to note that um, the, the underlying question is, should the referendum and initiative be more broadly useful in more states, um, and the threshold for getting things on the ballot, should it be more California and Oregon-like, uh, or should it be more Mississippi-like? If you, if you did the reading for today, you'll, you'll know that both of those, that California and Oregon are states that have direct democracy that is very easy to activate, and therefore there's a lot of ballot measures. And Mississippi, uh, the latest entrant into the usage of direct democracy, has a high threshold and a very limited set of questions that can be asked. Uh, and so direct democracy is uh, not, even though it exists in, 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 in formal terms in Mississippi, it's not really a tool for achieving any kind of reform. Um, so the, should states get, more states get it, only about half states have it, and should the states that already have it and the states that are gonna get it, should it be an easier tool like Oregon and California so that nationwide there's m many more ballot measures on every, uh, on every election? <clears throat> Crucially though, the question is, should there be a national referendum or initiative? <clears throat> what problem gets created when we have direct democracy in this way? Well, one of the problems that it actually gets created, but it also is mostly that it just is a failure to solve a particular problem. One of the, benef one of the problems is that elected officials don't have clarity over policy preferences. And so, because the, the people don't get to directly weigh in on specific policy issues. The problems created is that generally there's a narrow question or a, a narrow solution and a narrow set of options. So, for example, if a state is uh, facing revenue shortfalls, if it's having to cut programs that people don't want cut, and uh, the there's group, group you know, a, a, an organized group in that state that says, "Hey, we we need to get the state more money," and what that means is we need to create some kind of tax that is going to generate more revenue. Now. <clears throat> that group, first of all, is going to have to choose a tax avenue, right? 
One of the benefits of the legislature, I, I've only put the problems up here, one of the benefits of the legislature is that when a problem is identified, uh, a variety of solutions can be considered and, uh, and uh, proceeded on and investigated as you then winnow down to what the final bill is going to be. The way it works with direct democracy, at the, when it's an initiative at least, is that a group says, hey, we think that there ought to be a sales tax, right? There's no sales tax in Oregon. That's just leaving money on the table. Um, or we think that, that corporations don't pay enough money uh, in, uh, profit, in taxes on their profits, so let's have a corporate profits tax increase. Uh, the group is going to have to choose, and they're going to probably want to choose, one particular solution. And it's going to have to be narrow, especially if it's an initiative, right? If it's a referendum, it can be a bigger bill. I've, I've, I've addressed this before. Um, but it's going to be a narrow solution. And then, even if it is a big solution, even, even, even if it's a referendum, a referred bill, it's still going to be one solution. So there's, a, the, there's essentially two options. There's do you want nothing or do you want this thing, as opposed to do you want nothing, or do you want this kind of tax, or do you want this kind of tax, or do you want this kind of tax? The binary nature of either of these forms of direct democracy, right, creates a real problem. So a sales tax is rejected, or a corporate uh, pr uh, profits tax is rejected, or some kind of other tax is rejected. Now. We have a similar problem to when the legislature does or doesn't do something that we don't exactly know what that means. Does it mean that the people of that state don't think that there's a need for more revenue? Does it mean that the people of that state don't think that their tax burden ought to go up? Or does it mean that that particular option was unpopular and uh, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the concept of raising taxes. It's just that that particular tax raise, or even just the way that tax raise was, was framed, it's going to be, let's say that it's a 10% sales tax. People are like, no. Well, the ballot is not going to give us the ability to say, we want, I don't want a 10% sales tax, but I want a 5% sales tax, and I want these kinds of sales to be exempted from that, um, and uh, I would also prefer if... If the sales tax loses, I would prefer to have um, a 1% increase in the corporate uh, profits tax. It doesn't give us the ability to do that. Now, when a bill is being voted on in the legislature, it doesn't give legislators the ability to do that either. Except it does, because a bill, until it's, until it's voted up or down, is always amendable. And part of the legislative process, part of the thing that's great about a representative system, is it puts people in a place where it's their job to represent their constituents and deliberate with their fellow legislators uh, over um, how to solve problems, and it gives them way more options. So we don't have such a narrow solution and a, and a limited set of options in the, in the normal legislative process. Direct democracy, by its very nature, uh, or I should say not by its very nature, because there is a way to do this that doesn't succumb to this, but by any kind of proposal that is floated in the United States, is going to have this binary choice. The thing I, I gave you earlier uh, is possible. That you could, it's possible, our system doesn't allow for it, but it but doesn't mean there's no system that would. It's possible to have a ballot measure that uh, says, okay, if you choose to have a sales tax, do you want a 10 or a 5%? And then if the, sale, if the sales tax, yes, wins, then whichever the 10 or 5% has the most votes, gets to be the one that's done. And in fact, in that kind of system, you could vote for both. You'd be like, you know, I'd take a 10 and I would take a five. And then there would be other people who would be like, I only take a 10 because I want to make sure there's a lot of money. I won't take a five. And other people who would say, I'll take a five, but I wouldn't take a 10. Um, so there, there is a way of setting up an electoral system that overcomes this problem. Um, but it's not typically uh, used in, I mean, it, it just isn't the kind of direct democracy that's typically proposed. Proposed, Though there is a way to address this problem with, uh, I would say, a pretty complex version of direct democracy. Um, <clears throat> okay, so one of the other problems that comes up is that we're talking about voter awareness and education. One of the reasons why uh, people oppose direct democracy is because of a distrust 
in the ability of the common voter to analyze policy positions. Um, we barely spend time thinking about and analyzing our candidate selections. Uh, and uh, how are we going to actually be able to say, well, when people vote for this thing, that that represents a well thought out solution. And if we let uneducated, unaware, reactive people just vote for things, and mostly based on the wording and the initiative or based on the advertising that's on the yes and the no side, we're not really going to get better policy solutions. And we're not even necessarily going to get more democratic solutions, right? Just because a majority uh, uh, votes for something doesn't mean it's actually what the people really want, especially if they're not aware of what it is that they're actually voting yes or no for. Um, I remember that one of the ballot measures that passed when I was living in Seattle uh, in the 90s was to reduce the um, vehicle registration to a flat $30 fee. And it passed overwhelmingly. And the, one of the problems with that overwhelming yes vote was that people, the, the no side didn't do a very good job of, of making people aware of the fact that yes, you, some of you are going to save money. Right? Some of you with expensive cars are going to save money. Others of you really aren't going to save that money, much money because you're not paying that much more than $30 now uh, at all. But yes, yeah, some of you are going to save money. But you know what that money goes for? That money goes for ambulance services, ferries, public transportation, other emergency services. And so what you're voting for is you're voting to lose those services or have those services cost more. For example, ferry uh, uh, um, fares went up significantly after this because the subsidy provided by this uh, vehicle registration uh, tax, this, this uh, progressive vehicle registration tax, uh, that money went away. And now those services that were subsidized become more expensive. People just weren't aware of it. And ambulance uh, services went down and there were all kinds of things where people were like, why are you screwing up, government? Well, the answer is you screwed it up by voting for this flat, very low level vehicle registration tax. You decimated an important revenue stream for services that you didn't even know it was, it, it, it was uh, connected to, and you didn't think about it. Now, that is a failure on the part of the no on that initiative to make that clear to people, but it really is a failure on the part of people to just be able to pay attention to the policy nuances and the stream of information that's necessary to evaluate, uh, um, a, you know, even a simple thing is a complex policy, right? It seems very simple and it's single issue, right? Lower or make the vehicle registration tax in Washington state a $30 flat fee. That's actually a classic ballot measure because it's single issue, it's straightforward and simple, it's one, one change that just gets enacted, but nothing is that simple in terms of its consequences and every government policy is connected to numerous other government policies and so there's going to be interconnections that are going to change all kinds of things. It's actually a lot to ask citizens to evaluate not just what a ballot measure says, that's hard enough sometimes, but what its long-term or even in this case short-term and medium-term implications are going to be so that you can actually have a, a well-informed vote so that when ferry prices go up and ambulance service goes down and emergency services are, are, are underfunded, people at least can say, well, yeah, we knew that's what we were voting for. We're getting, we're living out the consequences of a choice that we made to balance less taxation versus, uh, and, 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 and fewer services, less well-funded services. Usually what happens is people are, are not aware of what those uh, consequences are going to be, or it's very difficult to make them aware. Now, there is a solution to this particular problem, or at least there, there's a, uh, a um, I won't call it a band-aid, there's, there's a kind of a medication for this problem, because it's not really a solution. And that's the Citizens Initiative Review. And there's a, you have a two page, a very quick reading on this. Uh, if you haven't done the Citizens Initiative Review reading, it's really more, it's a, it's a, it's a small pamphlet. It's not a college reading, it's a small pamphlet. Um, the Citizens Initiative Review is a process that essentially gets regular citizens enrolled in a deliberative investigative project to look at ballot measures, proposed ballot measures that are going to be on the thing, and to uh, do what uh, the ideal citizen would do, and to do it collectively. The ideal citizen would research the hell out of it, find out what it means, figure out what the pros and cons are, what are the hidden consequences, uh, talk to experts, read stuff. The ideal citizen that doesn't exist even close, no, there's no such thing as it. the ideal citizen uh, can be duplicated by the Citizens Initiative Review Board, 
Um, so it creates the ideal citizen analysis. And more, even more than that, because the ideal citizen actually then has to take a stance, the Citizens Initiative Review Board doesn't take a stance. It just makes the best argument for and against and in a simplified way that can be read, that's simple to understand, but, but reflects deep research and deliberation. Um, and so the idea being that, okay, people aren't gonna be able to spend a lot of time thinking about these things, and they're not gonna do their own research, and they need a simplified explanation of it to even, to even consider uh, considering that set of ideas. So let's get together a bunch of actual citizens, not experts, not legislators, not government regulators, but actual citizens, uh, and give them the resources to do what we would hope the ideal citizen would do, and then that can be turned over to the people through various means of publicizing it and making it available. And that would address this issue. It still doesn't address this problem, right? That there's still a narrow set of options because what the Citizens Initiative Review Board is going to be looking at is essentially a binary choice. And they're going to be producing two statements, one on the yes side and one on the no side. So it, it addresses one of the problems that's created by making widespread uh, um, direct democracy, but it doesn't address the other one at all, right? And in fact, to address the other one is highly complicated, right? To give, to, to make the, the ballot measure process one where people can make a series of uh, sort of interrelated choices uh, that are counted in particular kinds of way and there's preference voting, that's theoretically possible, but it's very complicated to think of that being implemented. Um, Okay, uh, another one of the problems that's created is um, that we have uh, the return of money as a power. And this is a critique that has been launched at um, uh, particularly the state of Oregon uh, and the states of Oregon and California that have initiative processes that are very open to getting things on the ballot and that actually get a lot of ballot measures and a lot of those ballot measures win is that the ballot measures that we get reproduce this disproportionate power that exists in the legislative uh, domain um, but even more clearly attached to money. Moneyed interests have the greater ability to, one, uh, you know, hire the right kinds of lawyers and, and, uh, um, and, and policy analysts to write a really good ballot measure, hire the right kind of uh, uh, political strategist to, to write a good ballot measure and create a good uh, campaign, to be able to fund a signature, a successful signature drive, and to be able to finance a, um, a high profile, usually television, uh, uh, can ad campaign to get the yes across the finish line and that there are plenty of ballot initiatives or even issues that would be supported by a lot of people but that they don't have and there's no specific single group that has the resources, the particularly the financial resources necessary to do all of the key steps to winning a ballot measure because winning a ballot measure is more than just getting a, uh, the majority of people to vote yes. That's actually the last step of a long series of steps that um, is, is really uh, very uh, problematic for a lot of groups. And the first step, as I've said, is writing the initiative in a way that one, it can be a single issue, two, it's going to withstand uh, judicial uh, um, scrutiny, uh, three, that it actually could have a successful appeal, then you have to get the signatures, then you have to pay for the, for the, um, the political campaign, and then you get the majority of votes. The initiative process actually, instead of undermining the role of money in the political system, it actually ex accentuates the role of money. Um, now, there are ways to mitigate against uh, a problem like that, but they're not very likely. I mean, for one thing, uh, it's you could reduce the number of the, the signature threshold because one of the biggest disproportionate uh, problems in ballot initiatives is that when you have to gather tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of signatures, uh, obviously people who can pay signature gatherers or organizations that uh, you know, can start sooner are gonna have a huge advantage. But if you lower the threshold too low, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna inundate the people with ballot measures and it's gonna, it, it's gonna raise this problem because there's not gonna be enough citizen initiative reviews and there's just gonna be all kinds of, it's basically it would, be, it would be this messy system of just tons and tons of ballot measures. So to get rid of this problem would essentially open an even worse can of worms, necessarily. Um, so 
part of the problem is that I didn't even put up here that, I mean, it's, it, it's connected to the disproportionate power. It actually, th this critique shows or claims that it doesn't change the disproportionate power that certain groups have. In fact, it just accentuates the difference in financial because money, here, you could be successful at lobbying, right? Disproportionate power at lobbying uh, elected officials. Here it's just money. If you can raise a lot of money and you can do it early and you can hire the best pros and you can hire uh, and you can pay for a lot of uh, ads, then you're gonna you're either you're gonna win. Um, and let's say that a you know a plucky poor group manages to pull together activist energy and they have supporters who are campaign experts and lawyers who can for free or for very low cost can write the initiative, do all the do all the stuff that's kind of expensive, and then they have this army of volunteer signature gatherers that gathers enough signatures and they get it on the ballot, well, the no side can now, and the no side, is, could, they can just wait around with their arms, they're like, okay, we'll wait until you get on the ballot, and then what we'll do is we'll raise a shit ton of money, and we will bombard the airwaves, television, radio, print, uh, social media, we will bombard the public with messages as to why they should vote no. Um, and you would think that, well, here's this plucky upstart group, they're gonna have a lot of votes. Maybe they are. Um, initially, but they're gonna maybe they have a lot of soft yeses that are people who are gonna be susceptible to this well financed uh, um, uh, a no campaign, and this this happens all the time uh, in in uh, states that have initiatives, in particularly in, in Oregon, which has an easy threshold for getting things on the ballot. Then the no's mobilize; they have lots of money. They can basically the no no is always an advantage anyway because all you need to do is poke a couple holes in the um, ballot measure, whereas the yeses have to actually show why the whole thing is like it's you have to answer all uh, potential uh, arguments against it. So if you're a if you have the no side and you're well funded, it's it's actually you're not always going to win, but in initiatives particularly. The, uh, that is the place where money does have a really, you're not buying votes, you're just buying access to people's eyes and ears and brains, and you're getting your message across more successfully. So the initiative had, it promised to be power f uh, for the people, right? Because the initiatives come from the people and the people get to vote on it, but the reality of modern uh, initiative drives and uh, of modern campaigns is that money is actually going to play a, a really huge role in this process as well. Um, the final problem created has most specifically, I don't know most of it, is specifically targeted towards the national referendum and initiative, which is that we would have to have some kind of new national voting method. We have no national elections in this country at all. Um, the American people do not get to vote for or against anything. We get to vote for our representatives in the federal government. Our members of the House get voted on in the state, in what is, while it's a federal election, it's a state-held election. It's, it's organized, administered, and regulated by the state government. Uh, our senators are the same thing. Obviously, uh, our governors are. Our president is elected by the Electoral College, which is 51 separate state elections. 50 states in the District of Columbia all have their own elections. We have no national elections. Um, we have a system of national government, Congress. We have a representative system that is national, and Congress represents the entire country and passes laws that apply to the entire country, but we never get to weigh in on, one, the entirety of the makeup of Congress, or even on the president. We vote for the members of the Electoral College, if you were going to create either an initiative or a referendum, or both, you would have to create some kind of national voting method. Now, in my example, with a presidential referendum, I chose to uh, not avoid this problem, but solve this problem with the simplest pathway available, which was um, that the Electoral College uh, in a fully proportional way, instead of having 535 electors because you have uh, the two senators added to each state, you would just use the number of representatives that that state has in the House of Representatives. And uh, if the ballot measure won that state, those votes would go as a yes. If the ballot measure lost that state, those votes would go as a no. And then it would be a simple majority of 435 uh, electoral referendum electoral votes. So I addressed this problem, but that is a new national voting method, 
right? It's basically taking the electoral college, transforming it slightly, making it less disproportional because of the extra, the two extra votes every state gets, uh, making it thoroughly proportional, and then putting it onto the states and say, okay, now you, you all, you hold elections, state elections every time anyway, just put ballot measures onto this national ballot measures. Um, so that is a simple way. Most proposals, however, don't use that method. They require some kind of national vote so that it's not uh, electoral college, which a lot of people have a problem with. It is a pure popular vote that 50% plus one votes is needed to get a yes across the finish line, and those votes can come from anywhere. How do you administer that? Well, currently, there's no national uh, electoral system, so we either we would have to create a um, national department of elections to hold these uh, national elections, um, or we would have to use the same mechanism that we currently have, which is state uh, departments of elections and state uh, secretaries of state holding elections, creating the ballots, putting them on there, and the, but then there would have to be some kind of national legislation that would govern the wording, and it would have to be the same wording on every ballot. There would be a whole new regulatory and procedural regime that would have to be created in order to do this. To, to, make, to, to bring an initiative or referendum to a state that doesn't already have it, you do have to add something to the state's electoral system, but it really is not that big of an addition. Uh, in fact, it doesn't represent a whole lot of different stuff because to get on the ballot in the first place, you can you can either be the representative of a major party or you can gather signatures. So there's already a mechanism with candidate elections for taking care of this. So it's less disruptive. It's less of a task of adding a referendum and or initiative to a state that doesn't have one than it would be adding it to the national level. And then there would be the problem of counting because if you're going to aggregate all the votes from all 50 states into one big pile, what happens when it's 50.1% 50 50 yes and 49.9% no? Well, there's almost certainly going to be calls for a recount, and there could even be legislation that triggers an automatic recount. Most states have legislation that triggers a recount automatically at a certain percentage uh, gap. So if, if the difference between the winner and the loser is less than half of a percentage point, that automatically triggers in a lot of states a recount of those ballots. What if it was 50.1% to 49.9%? Does every state have to recount? Or do only states that were close have to recount? How is the recount done and who pays for it and how what's the pacing and what's the time frame? It's potentially, it doesn't mean that it's wrong to do it. It doesn't mean, because this is, this is a pragmatic problem, not a theoretical problem. These other problems are sort of more theoretical problems uh, that are deeply embedded in the idea of uh, direct uh, democracy. This is really a pragmatic problem, but it's not a small one. And it's not as though, oh, it's just a pragmatic problem, we'll iron it out. It's like, well, yeah, will you? What, what happens when the recount then shows that it's actually, uh, the, what was previously 49.9%, if we recount in all the states, it becomes 50.4% to 49.6%. Like, okay, well, do we recount again? And do we only recount in states that flip their totals or what? Like, how does that happen? The, 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 the likelihood that recounts are going to be, that close elections are going to happen, if not all the time, at least frequently enough, that this will be a concern, right? The Electoral College is not too much of a problem because it's pretty rare, even though it's gotten more common recently, for the person who wins the Electoral College to lose the national popular vote. For a ballot initiative, it's almost certain that a lot of these are going to be close, and it's going to necessitate either doing a recount or accepting that, well, okay, we, the yes won, but we didn't recount because we would have to recount 160 million ballots, and that's just a ridiculous uh, procedure to go through. So that is a major uh, uh, threshold. Part of the claim of why we shouldn't create these problems, also, why we shouldn't have more direct democracy, either at the state level where states don't have it, or at the national level, is that these problems also don't address these problems necessarily, right? Like you would think that the clarity about policy preferences would be addressed by giving people the ability to vote directly on policies. But the problem is, is they're going to be voting on a binary choice with a narrow solution and a, and a single set, a single option. Um, so it doesn't, it, it gives us more clarity, but not necessarily a, a ton of clarity. Um, does uh, it give us greater responsiveness? Well, it might give us more laws that get passed, 
but um, does it really give us what the people want, especially if we have this problem? If we're voting nationally on, you know, let's say that we're going to vote on building the wall, it's just yes or no, right? It, and uh, if we get that, is that really responsiveness or is that just reactiveness? Is it just that, well, we want the wall and we're going to vote yes for it? And then we get it and we're like, oh, responsiveness is not just about getting something, it's about actually thinking through uh, and getting a good solution to something. So the problems that are created don't, uh, uh, excuse me, the problems that are created actually mitigate against the fact that the problems that are being addressed by more direct democracy um, are not in fact being addressed by it. Now, that doesn't mean that there's also not just a theoretical reason to say, hey, you know what, it's a democracy. And in a democracy, it shouldn't just be that the elected representatives get to decide. The people should as well. So you could, you could just flat out make a, a, a high level theoretical argument that says, the people ought to be able to choose, even though it's gonna come with downsides. Even this one, right? It's like if the people make bad, poorly informed choices, they have to live with the consequences of them. That's what life is like anyway. You make a stupid choice for yourself and it comes back uh, with unintended negative consequences. That's what being an adult means. You have to live with that. Um, so when, this, when, when people in the state of Washington voted for the flat $30 vehicle registration and then they had to face the loss of these essential services, they were just, that's what we all have to do when we make poor choices, right? Um, you just have to live with the consequences of it. So that's an argument for saying, well, direct democracy is, is in fact, gives the people the opportunity to screw up and face the consequences of, of their own choices. Um, and it doesn't get rid of the representative system. It just adds a new mechanism for making laws to one that is already here. We already know what the pros and cons of an elected representative system are. It doesn't get rid of the elected representative system. It merely adds another avenue to it. All right, well, that is the, that's the exploration of direct democracy as essentially a desired political reform by some people, and it's a desired political reform that would change the policy reform process, making it more open to direct action by the people. So do we want to engage in a political reform that widens the avenue of direct democracy that already exists? Do we want to widen that avenue or not? Um, that's the question that I've explored for the last hour, however many minutes, and I, I don't have a yes or no answer because it's really, it's a, it's, it's a controversial issue, but those are the contours of what it would take to be able to come down on the side of yes or no. All right, well that concludes part two of the class where we've explored um, the getting from here to there, getting across the finish line for particular kinds of, of reforms and what it is more specifically, what are the mechanics, what are the political dynamics, what are the pros and cons, what are the problems that are being solved and the problems that are new problems that are being created. I think hopefully this has been a thorough and comprehensive exploration of the four different avenues and that now we can move on in the final part of the class to our applied exercise where we're going to take democratic theory, we're going to take our knowledge of political strategy, we're going to take our ability to weigh pros and cons and uh, um, uh, balance trade-offs and to seek unintended consequences and apply all of that to a specific question of political reform, which is should the Portland city government form be changed? And if so, in what particular direction. And we're gonna spend, uh, after you guys have a Thursday, this Thursday off to finish your paper, we're gonna spend the final uh, three weeks of the course going through a, uh, a guided exercise in that. It's actually gonna be uh, partly guided by me, but mostly it's going to be group work. And it's, that's an experiment. We'll see how that works in the remote instruction model. This is my not very last recorded lecture. I have one more where I'm gonna talk about the city club report on the Portland city government and do a little bit of kind of uh, preliminary work to prepare you. Essentially, I'm going to give you a briefing on what it is that your task in re you know reforming the Portland City Government is. I'm going to give you a, a, a pretty detailed, exhaustive briefing. But the reading, the City Club report, is actually also a pretty detailed, exhaustive uh, briefing as well. So this is this is the end of this kind of big political science -y stage of the class where we looked at the mechanisms and the trade-offs and the pros and cons and and the political dynamics. All right, well that's it. I, will, uh, I won't see you guys next week. I will see the camera next week. The camera will see me, and you will see me on the camera. That's how it goes. All right, signing off from day 60. I'll see you next week.